We're here from some of the poster sessions at ISTE 2016, and I am here with Brian Miller. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, Brian Miller at EdTechNerd on Twitter. You can see my awesome sticker that Tony made for me uh, for, Tony Pe for Tony Scope. Uh, I'm the Educator Community Manager at Wonder Workshop, and I also speak internationally on Connected Toys uh, for Top Tech EDU. So you can check us out there at toptechedu.com. Uh, but really excited to be here today and walk through this space with you. Yeah, me too. So we were in, supposed to do this on Periscope, but the internet is not reliable for us. So you're watching this not live, but that's okay because uh, I think you'll still see a lot of great stuff. And, and Brian has such good insight into this stuff. So I know in our Periscope we started talking, but we might as well recap. Uh, what, are, what are we seeing here? So right here we have students that have done a project-based lesson on the STEAM classrooms using the Smithsonian Invention Kits, which are kits that are pre-built that, that you can purchase, and it gives you an opportunity to work on a number of different things like robotics, um, well, um, more of the lighting and building and maker uh, electronics components that they're connecting together. Uh, it's a more advanced version of like Little Bits or Makey Makey, um, because you can do some more robust pieces where it actually does require you to solder. Um, so it's kind of the next step. So this is actually perfect because it looks like Buford Middle School is using this uh, for a middle school lesson, which is definitely a little bit more advanced. Now, is soldering dangerous to do in a classroom? Uh, it can be, you know, under uh, teacher direction, I think you're okay. Um, but for the most part, you're dealing with any, you're dealing with the heating element, you know, so being around and being present is a big piece of that just to make sure students don't get burnt. But um, with a little instruction, you know, you can show anyone how to easily solder. Yeah, I think one of, us, one of them want to show us uh, what they've made. Yeah. Do you guys mind being on video? That's fine. <laughs> <Tony>! <laughs> Laura, hi. <laughs> uh, what, 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 can you tell us about one of your uh, creations here? Okay. Who's gonna talk? Somebody jump up. Okay. So this is a speaker right here, and what it is is a cone inside a box, and inside here that you can't actually see, there's a solenoid. That, oh, okay. No. So there's a solenoid that has a magnet. So the Solenoid is part of the cone. Oh yeah, so here, okay. So here we have the cone which has a little mini solenoid as part of it. And when you send power through it like that, the thing vibrates. <laughs> yeah, the solenoid vibrates and the magnet cr you does all... Th no, the, because... So. Okay, hold on. Kaylee, you talk. <laughs> um, the... Yeah, when you send electrical current through the solenoid, um, well, so this is alternating current, so it means it's switching directions while it's going through, and so that means that uh, when it creates an electromagnet in the solenoid, which is the coil of wire, the magnet will be uh, attracted, but since the magnet is held in place by this, um, the cone will move back and forth, and because we have it at such a high level, uh, it will move back and forth faster and make vibrations instead of like a definite, like just going like this. And uh, that makes the music. And so, so, how much of this did you have to put together yourself? Um, well, <laughs> we had to put like this part together but uh, the rest so the box the boxes the basket um, cone and um, yeah that, that's it and spiders we had to make those but everything else was like yeah, yeah we were provided with this part and the foam part around the cone yeah what grade are you girls in we're, we were in eighth grade, yeah, and ninth graders. Ninth graders so. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, they do. They right? add to your ribbon collection here. Eventually, this will get put on YouTube, so we can oh, see nice. that. <laughs> there you go. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Out of here. All right. So the 
thing that I like about the Smithsonian kits is, you know, they were talking a little bit about what they were able to do with it, but it was a kit that they purchased and it walks them through all of the steps. So, you know, you're dealing with a curriculum that they already have that's created. You can purchase the tool and then from there you can build it and construct it and actually make a physically working speaker. So the students are learning how the inner workings of that are actually functioning, which is really neat to have and especially, to, you know, to see girls doing this. I think that that's, that's such a great thing as well. Yeah, and I'd, li I'd like to see, you know, follow them and see what they come up with next. You know, after you make a speaker, how do you improve upon that? Or what's the next step? What do you add to it? Yes, the different iterations are always impressive to see. Because now that they understand the foundation, they can build from, from that and make something even more impressive. All right, let's see. Let's do Games in the classroom. He we're going to take a walk over to... Uh, this young student talking about Dashing Dot, uh, who is incredible. She could basically work for Wonder Workshop. At least 50 of those. You don't have to hear I will ask you for information. All right. Is it okay if we do the Yes. Okay. All right. Awesome. By the way, I need to be know how to use this. Now you turn. <laughs> Put it in video. Put it in video. Um, Polo, you want to share with us what you're doing? I can give you just to videotape and everything. Well, we're going to have this on YouTube also. Okay, so this, right. this will be available. So, yeah, right. <laughs> so we had several people coming to so, so, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, Dash and Dot for yeah, people who so, don't know. Them. So Dash and Dot robots are robots that are designed for kindergarten through fifth grade students that teach them all about computer science and coding through tangible toys such as the robot. So um, this is something that can be implemented across all curricular areas. We have a number of different lessons and ideas that you can use while you working with them in the classrooms. Uh, Teachers.makewonder.com is the site that you can go to get that information. And we are also offering the opportunity to help fund clubs getting started. So we provide teachers with lesson plans, examples, but also provide them grant opportunities. We're giving away $10,000 to schools as well to help them fund coding in their schools. And while we're here at ISTE, we're giving away a dash a day as well. So people that are, uh, are unfortunately not here, they would, uh, they'd be missing this, but um, we're, we're really excited to, to be doing this. So Pola. Yeah. So which one is dash and which one is dot? Because some people might not. And this is dot. This is dash and this is dot. Dot is the one little circle. And Dash can move. Yeah, he can move because he has wheels on the bottom. So he. Can hold the microphone? Sure. There you go. Hi. <laughs> nice and high. There you go. <laughs> so tell us what you've learned from them. Um, I've learned to code them with Blockly. It's an app. They have five apps. And Blockly is my favorite because you can add whatever you want to do. And it's coding. So, like, People like when I do that more because they say it's like the real thing coding and it's my favorite. So if you put like you can put start and then you can put light green. So he'll turn green once you put start or you can do once you move. If you clap, he'll turn. He'll say hi. Or if you flip him, he'll do this. Or if you click button three, he'll do this. It's it's really cool. And xylophone is also really cool because if you put this on his head, he'll play and you code with your phone. It's a whole xylophone and there's dots that you click on your phone and it he'll do the lights and he'll play on the xylophone. So what's the craziest thing you've ever programmed him to do? Uh, so we did a maze, me and my dad, and it took me a really long time because it was like a maze all around the house, like in a barely big part of my house. So. We put tape, and I had to follow the tape with the exact coding on my phone on Blockly. So you had to get him from the start to the end, and it was a lot of fun, but it took a really long time. So, Polo, can you tell us a little bit about your club that you started at your school? Yeah, so it started because my teacher, she was unpacking them, and she had to start them up. So I offered if I can start them up for her. And she said, yeah, so I started them, and I got, like, really interested with all this stuff. And, like, with the xylophone, it was the first thing because... It, it's like a lot of fun because it does noises and it turns colors. So I started with that and then I told my parents if I can buy one and they let me for my birthday. And so um, I started my own club. I asked Miss P if I can start my own club. And so we do a lot of stuff like we do mazes and we build Legos on top of them. And it, it's a lot of fun. Like we make movies with them 
and we put this on top. It's a lot of fun, and we need to dress them up, and it's a and, lot of. And Paula, can you show everyone your nails? Yeah. Oh, tell me more about this. It's the eye of Dash and Dot. And it's also on your shirt. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> He's nice and happy. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Uh, we have a little something for you. Yep. A little ribbon to add to your badge. Thank you. And that's where we'll put the video whenever the internet works. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> it's so neat to see her excitement with yeah. that. And so <laughs> take a picture together. All right. I'm the teacher, so that's uh, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's we're Come we're taking pictures you don't you don't see this on the video but that's okay <laughs> you're welcome ah it's neat that that she's been so inspired from you to to do that that's really great ah yeah <laughs> thanks again It's funny, people are either really nervous about being interviewed or they're very excited. <laughs> um, yeah, so one thing if you're watching this on, on uh, YouTube is that we can't switch the camera back and forth like I would like to with Periscope. So uh, we're just living with it. <laughs> Let's see. We have... Still fabrication. This one's neat. Okay, yeah. St. Margaret's Episcopal School, Make, Create, Fabricate. It rhymes. Yeah, so one, so one of the neat things about makers is the ability to, you know, create some really cool fabrication. And we're talking a lot about, you know, getting all genders involved in creating and sharing their talents. And part of this is, you know, this a, a lot of times uh, relates to what girls are looking for. And we actually met Pola, who is interested in coding, and that's wonderful as girls. We're, we met some girl engineers as well. So to see that represented is actually incredible um, here. But here what they're working on is they're working on fabrication. So they're adding, it looks like, some LED lights um, to some of the designs that they're making. They're allowing some of the participants to create as well. Um, and they are building basic circuits that with a watch battery to have it light up. So tell me then... It, the What's the difference between making, creating, and fabricating? So making would be, uh, it's a really good question, so <laughs> got going to get me stumped here. So it depends, you know, there's a lot of people that have different ideas as to what it is. So um, making is the ability to build something um, from, uh, from current elements that are available. Creating is something where you think of it from, um, you know, an idea that you have that you want to kind of build and create uh, a new thing that hasn't been done before. And fabricating is taking something that's existing and adding some modifications to it that allows you to do some really cool things. And in this case, they're modifying, it looks like, some snowflakes that they're cutting and placing on the location in which they are on the map. So wherever they live, they're marking themselves with uh, these cutouts that they're making and fabricating them with an LED light to make them light up and come to life. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. <laughs> so there's definitely overlap of those words, right? Yeah, it, it, you know what? They all carry together, and you know the maker culture is embracing all of those things, and and, and really good. Doesn't matter spaces. what you call it. Is. No, it, and and in good maker spaces, you'll see all of that stuff happening. So for the fact that they're using all three words means that they're doing something really cool. Yeah. You could have a maker space, a create space, or a fabricate space. Yeah, absolutely, you can have a fabrication lab where it's just you know um, fabrics or different pieces that you're adding to it. A fab lab, is fab that? lab, yeah, exactly, yep. So, the uh, maker lab, maker space, fab labs, you know, they they all have the same idea built around them. Yeah. Good right, stuff. Let's 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 keep going. This the windows in here make some really interesting lighting effects. <laughs> this is. So, so not professional video right now, but that's all right. It, this could probably be an audio podcast almost, too. With, and then tinkering is another word I see. How does that fit in? So it's, it's all related. <laughs> uh, tinkering's related as well, you know, dealing with objects and just kind of manipulating and changing them around and um, building on to what they currently do. There's, there's a lot involved in, in all those, those words, and they all kind of relate one another. So let's go to the sunny corner, or unless you saw something. That no, yeah, let's go. Let's head over that way. So this one's about hour of code. This is, this is steps to start a low-cost coding club. 
And it uh, looks like a lot of our code stuff, um, which I think is great because they've created such a really nice curriculum that allows anyone to implement coding into their school for no charge. They do a lot of the instruction, they provide teacher resources, and they pull from a number of different areas beyond just the our code stuff. So they partner up with other companies, uh, different apps that you can work with. And it's become a movement that a lot of people have jumped on board with because coding is going to be you know, something that we're gonna rely on in the future. People being able to manipulate and change through computer science is going to be um, how we will progress as an economy um, later on in the future. So preparing our students now is such a big piece and it looks like they have a couple different things. So starting an after school club and it's a great way to get coding into your school. If you don't have the time in your schedule to do that or the budget, you can create this after school club where people of the similar interests can join together and do this. Family hour of code, I think, is a fantastic thing. Yeah, that I hadn't, I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, so that home to school connection is so important because you know the students are working on it in classrooms, but what's happening when they're at home? And that's one of the things that we want to be able to to learn a little bit about as well. And, and teach, uh, teach parents about this because we want them involved and in seeing what the students are able to create and do and hopefully create that interest and embrace it because it's really going to be the, from the support of the parents that is going to be able to allow those students to continue on with it. I have three-year-old twins, and they're coding with the, with the Osmo coding app. Right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is the best app, isn't it? It's so good. The little tiles they move around, and they, they're, I mean, they're, they're three, so they're, it's a little hard for them, but they're, but they're starting to get a hang of it. Right. And I saw your Periscope of you doing it as well, and it's, uh, it's actually one of our top tech toys that we talk about also. Uh, but it's, you know, these connected toys that teach coding, um, it allows people from all different um, backgrounds and skill levels to begin to learn about how to integrate computer science into their lives. So the earlier we can do that, it's like teaching a world language. Yeah. You know, we want to be able to give them the opportunity for their brain to develop and grow. And this being part of that, I think, is a really great, great idea and tool. So, yeah, computer science is here to stay. It's something that the government's continuing to embrace and grow with. So we're excited to see uh, from developer standpoints what comes out in the future. So let's talk about drones. Okay. What do you know about them? So I'm a big fan of drones. Uh, um, I like the drones that you can actually program rather than just fly. You know, you can do some really cool maker projects where you build and create drones from prefabricated projects that you can purchase um, because the science behind it is very complex. So they have really nice kits that you can purchase. But what I'm a fan of are some of them that you just go into the store and purchase and use and program using with an app, app like Tickle. So Tickle runs across multiple apps. If you're not familiar with it, check out Tickle. You can download it for your iPad or Android. It connects multiple devices. So it works with Sphero. It works with uh, the Parrot drones. It works with Dash and Dot. So it's all block program language, but you can then program a drone to fly, which I think is really cool. So it brings the excitement of drones into your classroom. And so I asked about drones too, because there's a poster session in the corner about drones. So let's, let's go see what they have. There and see, yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of drones. One of the first drones the, was the AR drone. It was this huge thing that, That's like, right. and loud. Uh, it was really fun. And now drones have shrunk down uh, considerably. And you know that drone was so expensive, and then they, and then they crash, and you're like, oh man, that's a lot of money down the tubes. Yeah, and and they've come down in price dr dramatically. And you know the fact that you can easily purchase and implement them into schools, I think, is a is a really cool thing. The sad news is I don't think there's a drone here. I don't see any drones, but I do see behind us BB-8 Spheros. Okay. So Let's go to that. All right. <laughs> no drones, but we have droids. So we have <laughs> using robots to foster creativity and empathy in classrooms. And that's such a cool concept. It's trying to pair up empathy into using robotics. So, um, you know, how do we teach empathy within schools? Um, but I, I'd personally like to hear what this guy has to say to, to learn a little bit how he's doing it. But he has here a couple of things. He has the Sphero ball. Um, it looks like he's using Sphero to do that. Um, at least that's what he brought with him. So he has the regular Sphero version. He has the Spark version on the table, which is a see-through version. So you can see what is happening inside. And then they have the new Star Wars edition BB-8 version as well. So they have two different versions of that. They have the regular BB-8 version, but they also have the new battle edition that's going to be coming out, where it looks like BB-8's been run through, you know, the, the fights and the battles. Oh, I, I didn't know that, that was one, coming. That one's coming out, yeah, yeah. But I'm really interested to hear about how they... In, in Connected to empathy. empathy. Yeah, so it looks like he has some worksheets and things. Yeah, well, we'll get that, and then we'll, we'll talk to him in a, in a moment here. Um, <laughs> Sphero on a mountain main. All right, this really doesn't make sense without yeah, <laughs> him telling us what it is, and I'll get the, 
there's a there's a QR code or a link for you guys watching. All right, let's see if he went. <laughs> well, I, I, but I'm not going to edit this. Is the thing because that'll take that's too much time. <laughs> so I'm treating this like it would be a Periscope. Because if I had to go back and edit, it would never, it'd never get done. It's too too much work. <laughs> so I think this is this must be Richard Perry. I can't see his name tag. But, well, that's that's the thing. That, so there's people waiting, waiting to talk to him, and I hate butting in. I just know. just because I have a microphone and a phone on a stick doesn't mean <laughs> I can cut in front of people. But I would just like to put the microphone in front of him so we could hear him. But I'm too shy. <laughs> I know I hate interrupting. I don't want to like he's going with his flow, you know. <laughs> Well, I we have the we have the web web address bit.ly slash classroom robots. So we'll we'll come back to him maybe <laughs> or we'll we'll check that out. Well let's go let's go around the back here. So we visited uh, the Google Docs add-on guy from this morning. Like usually the oh more spheros. <laughs> let's see. Using tickle, just what you were talking about. <laughs> Oh, so there's Sphero and then there's Ollie. Yeah, so, the, so Ollie is also owned by Sphero. Um, these are robots that um, kind of don't have the full 360 degree mobility like the, the ball does, but it mo rolls forward, backwards, it spins all around in circles. Um, it's a different way of controlling and it's actually much, much, much faster as well. So you can do some really neat tricks with it. Um, they come in, again, in a couple different versions. One thing to point out if you're interested in, in uh, Sphero or Ollie, uh, Sphero is completely waterproof. So you can do some really neat art projects with painting and coding. So you can code and then you have it lay on a, a canvas and you have it paint out what you've actually done. Um, Ali is not waterproof. So that's one that you want to remember. <laughs> and uh, I've, I know people have made mistakes thinking that it was. Yeah, my, uh, my son learned to crawl because he wanted my Sphero. Oh, and so I awesome. put it in front of him, moving a little bit. And like, he wanted it so badly that he's going to figure out a way to get to it. That's and then eventually so cool. the Sphero like, was so slow compared to him. Yeah. He'd get it and throw it or put it in his mouth. So I guess, yeah, I didn't know it was waterproof. but And they have the rubber nubs that you can use, you know, to keep it less from scratching up. But dogs love it and pets. Uh, so you have your cats or dogs chase it around. My cats are not happy with this. <laughs> when the Sphero's out, they're not happy. Yeah, yeah. I can see other cats might enjoy it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> throw a little laser pointer in there, too, and they're having a ball. No pun intended. <laughs> so then we have some tickle code here uh, telling it to... When you start playing, to, to go left and change color and do all it, change speed and all that, just by connecting those different little code blocks together. Yeah, the thing that I love about Tickle is um, they've cr taken a language that most uh, educators are familiar with because of Hour of Code and some other beginning coding programs. And they've unlocked a lot of really neat features within a lot of these connected toys. So the developers for these connected toys may not have necessarily created an app that can teach computer science, but Tickle has created the ability to code using block programming language and connected through their APIs. So they've unlocked a lot of really neat features that you may not even find in the developers' apps who created the connected toy. So that's neat. Yeah, yeah, so they do a really nice job with that. Hey. And see what they're, they're and, yeah, she. Let's go around the side here. <laughs> maybe she's eyeing us. Today. I don't want the camera to come talk to me, or maybe she does. <laughs> Jennifer, do you do you mind being on video? <laughs> you can say no. That, that's fine. <laughs> okay, awesome. So, uh, tell us about your poster. Uh, so this is a project that we did with seventh and eighth grade pre-algebra back in September. Uh, our math teacher, Pete Smith, wanted to review the number line with the kids. So we had two Spheros and two Ollies. Um, we did the lesson, we demonstrated it for them first. Um, had the Spiro, you know, turned green, went in the positive direction, turned red, went in the negative. And then we had the kids go to one of the four whiteboard walls and write what they observed. So this was all just kind of silent. We didn't tell them what we were doing. And then um, after they came back, we demonstrated it again. And then you just started seeing the light bulbs go off. We were like, what are you observing? What is this doing? And they're like, oh, it's the number line. So we put them into groups of three or four. 
each group had an iPad and they used the Tickle app, an iPad and a robot. They used the Tickle app to um, program the robots to move along the number line. Um, they had to come up with their equation, program it, and then demonstrate it for their class. Um, so that's some of what you're seeing on the video. Um, the excitement where they're, you know, they're getting the equation right or wrong. Um, and it was just a really great visual way um, and very hands-on way for them to get this early concept that they needed for pre-algebra. Um, but also a lot of collaboration, things you don't always see in a math class or a pre-algebra class, um, but you know, got them working together very early on in the year. So. I love the connection to the number line. Yes, yeah. And we use, you see the Hot Wheels tracks, we use those. Sphero is a little wobbly on tile, and so when we started thinking number line, we didn't want it to wobble, and I had a huge box of Hot Wheels tracks in my office. Um, I'm the library director, so I had just, you know, all the toys. Uh, so I had the Hot Wheels tracks, and we laid those down and tried that, and it worked great. So we just gave the Hot Wheels tracks to the kids and said, go, you know, yeah. What was their biggest challenge when they were presented with this? Was it uh, learning how to code or was it the actual math concepts? It was, part of it was coming up with their equation. Uh, so some of them, you know, we gave them the iPad, they just started programming. Uh, and it was kind of like, well, where are you going with this? And they lost track of what numbers they were using. So we kind of had to refocus them. Uh, we had them in four different classrooms and all, we had some empty rooms at the time. So we were rotating among the groups and just talking to them, checking in with them. Um, some of them wanted to go really big, like 26 minus 50. And we were like, okay, got to fit in the classroom, you know? So think about the size, let's scale it down a little bit. They tried to trick each other. So some tried to flip the number line and they were like, no, it's really going in the positive direction, not the negative. So, you know, just refocusing them on that. Um, but they were having fun with it and, and learning these concepts that was just great. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Sure, thank you. And then do you have some information online? It looks like uh, you have a, there's a QR code. code that goes to my um, jenniferhanson.tumblr.com. Um, there's also there. There's a blog post we wrote about it, and another presentation we've done. Um, these videos will be there. Um, you can download the lesson there. Um, yeah, and then we've got you know the lesson that people can take here as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we have this for right. you for being. Oh, that's on right. Yes. Tony <laughs> so you can add that to your bed. Uh, TonyScope.com. <laughs> right at that address. I have it somewhere else, but okay. Uh, it'll probably be on like YouTube, and then but it'll be linked on there, so that'll be where you can find it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Our first year with collaborative maker spaces and 3D printing. So actually, I'm kind of amazed that we've gone this far without seeing 3D printing yet. Yeah, I'm, I honestly think that this is maybe one of the only ones that are 3D printing because uh, it's a lot to bring, you know, especially well, yeah, when you're traveling. Yeah, so they, they brought 3D printers and they're actually printing stuff live right now. Um, and they have a number of different things that they've also printed out. So, um, so yeah, this is a great way to, you know, a, a great tool to bring into your classrooms uh, to talk about, you know, different things that you can create from scratch, but also things that you can download to create as well and manipulate and change. Uh, it definitely has a place in every maker classroom because the students can design something from scratch or manipulate um, and see what their outcome is. So they're designing digitally and then they're printing it for the physicality, which is one of the coolest parts of, uh, of, of dealing with these. And it looks like they have a ton of stuff that they've printed out on the table as well. So we'll have to sneak over there to see. Yeah. Our way through. <laughs> Oh, you have a 3D printed tie that you're wearing? Yes. <laughs> Do you mind being on video? Sure. <laughs> uh, you, you've got to, you've got to tell me about your tie. Would you mind holding the microphone? When, that way I can get your whole tie. Okay, um, this was made on Tinkercad, and it took a lot of time. I looked at a real tie, and then I measured it and everything, and then I made it elastic, so it's stretchy. So you can actually take it off and everything right here. So it's like a real tie. And then we printed it. It takes a long, long time to do. Like, there's lots of stuff like this took two hours. This took six hours in a whole because each part, each color took uh, two hours. So it takes a long time to do stuff. So when... When you print this, do you have to then go in and change the color? So like you have to print all the whites at once? Is that how it works? Or you can tell it which, it'll switch colors on its own? Uh, no, you have to switch the colors. Like right here we have blue 
and you inside the extruder you'll see it if you go walk around on the other mm -hmm. side you'll see the extruder and you have to pull the other color out and put the next color in so i printed this part one time this one a second time and this one a third time so i printed them all in three different times so so then um how often have you worn this tie a couple times, couple times. yeah yeah, I mean, I can think of so many occasions to wear a, a 3D printed tie. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> but it's, yeah, what did you learn from doing this? Oh, uh, lots of stuff. You got to really make stuff really exact. Pretty exact or it's not going to be right. Did you, did you have a version where it wasn't right? Uh, yes, the first time I made it, I thought it was the right size, but it was only from here to here size. And it was super, super small, so I had to really upsize it make it a uh, scale or two bigger a couple scales bigger what else do you have some other things on this table can you tell me about them uh yes we have a table right here a desk for like at school and it's a scale project for math so i scaled it down from the actual thing oh, so you based it off of a real object yes um another thing we have is a keychain over here Right there, that was one of our things for Valentine's Day. We had to make a bunch um, for candy grams yeah. for school. We have a catapult in the back. Does it really work? Yes, it does. Ah, <laughs> it does. Yes, it does, but right, we didn't want to bring anything so we don't lose the pieces, but they're pretty small. Yeah. You could shoot like peas or something out of there. You could shoot little stuff if it fits it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then do you have like a, a Google like a cardboard viewer? Is that what, what's made here? So we were trying to make a Google cardboard. Since the 3D printer is much smaller, we're probably going to have to make it in half because we're needing it bigger. See, it doesn't totally fit. But the lens are a little small. But the nose pieces are about the same size, should be right. We haven't fully got the piece on the side to hold your phone. And we made the rubber band so it stays on your head. So instead of holding it like this, it will stay on your head and you can just move around. It's amazing. Something like this, there's a lot to think through, huh? Yeah, there's lots of stuff you have to think through to make things. Just simple as this, you have to think hard. Just simple as a name tag, you have to think. What was the most difficult thing that you've done so far in your class? Um, Class-wise, nothing so hard, but stuff that I want to build was actually pretty hard, like this. This took me like a couple, like three weeks or four weeks to make, because I had to make it super exact, and I had to make it pretty exact and make it took a couple weeks, like I said. Has anybody else made a tie, or this is like... You're the only one who did it. This is, I'm the only one who did it. Um, for our school, this is our first wearable thing for our school. The next thing we're making is a bow tie ah. instead of an actual tie. Yeah. A bow, tie. bow tie. Yeah. Cool. Well, Cameron, thank you for sharing. Yes. You're welcome. We, have a, we have a little uh, ribbon so you, that you can add to your name badge if you want. We'll put this video on YouTube a little bit later and it's at that address. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That was fun. I love his explanations of stuff. Seriously, what a cool student. I mean, to, to be excited enough to, you know, try to solve a problem on his own, that probably wasn't a class activity that he had to solve. He had a passion to do that and spent his own time creating and, and dealing with all those mistakes and failures and kind of working through it. So, you know, he had an idea. There were no directions, I'm sure, on how to do it. And he had to work through. Yeah. And, and even something as simple as, you know, the 3D printer not being large enough to print his Google Cardboard, you know, and trying to come up with a way to make that actually work by putting two pieces together. You know, these are skills that we want our students to leave with, you know, working through challenges, working through problems, dealing with failure, you know, recovering from that, uh, being creative thinkers, you know, what they're doing in that class, you know, really inspired that student to do some really cool things. So uh, it, I love talking to students when they're that passionate, and he definitely was. And he was not shy at all. For sure, for sure. Well, I think this is getting to be a, a long video for YouTube, so we'll probably wrap this up. Maybe we'll see if Periscope will work for a second part. Uh, but Brian, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Like you have so much insight into this. And so people contact you. How do they do that? Uh, they can do that by 
Uh, Twitter's the easiest way, at EdTechNerd, or you can visit me at Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, LMiller.com, or you can follow us at TopTechEDU, uh, where we talk about a lot of the stuff you saw today in Connected Toys as well. Awesome. You know, I love chatting with you so much. Can we do this again maybe, maybe Wednesday? I think I'm available Wednesday, yeah, around so, closing keynote time afterwards, yeah. After the keynote's done, let's talk about the cool things that we've seen here. Yeah, At, that, the 3D printed tie, I might have to call dibs on that one. I, that one's a pretty cool one. I now want to get a 3D printed tie, I think. I've seen 3D printed bow ties, but not a tie like that. Yeah. So that was pretty impressive. It, it is a conversation piece. Absolutely. <laughs> but I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. I mean, to be able to share with viewers at home that are not actually here live, you know, some of the amazing experiences that we're getting to see in person and transferring that to them, I think is just such a great opportunity to continue to learn. Yeah, the, the poster sessions are my favorite. Having all this stuff in like just, you know, a couple steps later, you're 3D printing and then a couple more steps, you're at dash and dot and it, 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 making stuff fabrication is just all right here. Yeah, exactly. So this has been a wonderful opportunity. So thank you. And I look yeah. forward to doing more on Wednesday. <laughs> my pleasure. We'll see you later.